All right, welcome to another episode of Leaders and Legacies. I'm excited to uh, welcome Matt Zahn. He is an award-winning speaker and st storyteller who empowers business leaders to inspire the teams and clients to action through the art of strategic storytelling. Matt's past engagements in the private sector have catalyzed uh, radical sales increases for over 300 organizations that range from financial institutions to the health and wellness industry. In addition to his work in the private sector, Matt has worked with hundreds of politicians to improve the quality and reach of their engagement. Matt worked closely with these clients on their media and communication strategies, including speeches and campaign messages at the local, state, and national level. To achieve this remark, these remarkable results, Matt shares his experience in persuasion with CEOs, executives, and, and sales professionals who he coaches in the art of influence and how to leverage this for profit and impact. Matt, welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Craig. I appreciate it. So, Matt, I've been looking forward to this, this talk. Uh, for a number of reasons. One, I've gotten to know you over uh, LinkedIn, and uh, you just, you have a very generous, very welcoming heart. You know, I, and, you know, I think that's a, a gift. Uh, but let's just, let's just kind of back up a little bit. Um, it, it go into a little bit more detail. So I've told the audience what you do. Give us an example. What, you know, if, if I were to, you know, if you were to come into my company, what would you do for me? Sure. Great question. Yeah. So very quick uh, cliff notes version, if you will, on my background, I was a political speech writer for quite some time, well over a decade. And there's things in the political messaging world that are not taught when it comes to businesses. So there's a lot of individual and in, in, individuals in the business space that might be focused on marketing or messaging or even in how to persuade and inspire and impact. But there's a lot of elements that we utilize in politics that are not utilized in business. So I think immediately businesses are intrigued by that, you know, what's going on in politics that we could utilize. And I've, I've really built a, a workshop that I pretty much start with a workshop when it comes to companies and I come in and we do a very deep dive into story strategy regarding their business. So I take different elements that I, that I learned over many, many years of trial and error when it comes to the political world and teaching leaders how to really utilize these to do what they want to do, whether it's persuade staff, whether it is uh, persuade their clients and build out more of a following. Uh, but there's a lot that they can be doing that I will tell you very, very, very few companies are doing at all. So you said trial and error, and it, give us, what are some examples of common mistakes that you see people make where they're trying to do the right thing and doggone, they just step on the right gun intentionally? Sure. I mean, I think that one of the most, I was going to say difficult, it's not necessarily difficult, but one of the biggest missed opportunities that I see is when businesses find stories that work, they're not documenting those stories. So if I were to come into a manufacturing plant that makes a really good widget, so to speak, they have machines built to do that, right? If, if, if the part that they're making works, you build a machine around it so you can crank out those parts with ease so that they can do what they want to do, which is supply value to their customers, right? And it's interesting that when we find stories that really work, they're inspiring, they're persuasive, they connect with whoever we're trying to connect with, there's no documentation built surrounding those stories. You know, I've never heard a business leader tell me storytelling is not important. No one should focus on it, What, right? We all understand the importance. Well, okay, if there's a if there's a huge magnitude, a huge importance, what are you doing behind the scenes to set up documentation to really get those stories to work for you? What do I mean by that? Stories being documented in a CRM when it comes to clients, stories documented in a, I call it a story bank that an executive can put in their story bank, literally, not figuratively, but literally stories making 
depositing stories into the story bank so there could be withdrawals out, figuratively speaking, in a staff meeting session so that they can inspire staff. And very, very, very few people do that. And that's why uh, it it's, can be agonizing, you know, what messages to, to stick here and there. And I think that's the biggest missed opportunity that I see when it comes to stories. Interesting. Now, what is it about, now you say everybody knows that stories are important and storytelling is important. What is it about storytelling that's persuasive versus other means? Well, it's, it, it is how the stories are intentional. And I always like to use the verb strategic storytelling. So stories, there's a lot of research. It really connects us to empathy, compassion, love, right? So there's a definitely a human element, but also people want to see themselves in your story. So if you are a company selling something, where does that person fall within that story? You know, that's why one of, it's one of, not the the only, but one of the ways to do that is to position a customer as the hero of the story or the or the main character that you're edifying. Because if you're edifying someone that you've worked with, even you, Craig, like you've helped a tremendous amount of people, right? So if you're edifying one of your clients that you've helped, I'm starting to see myself in that story knowing, okay, well, if Craig can help John, then Craig can help me. And it, I think that's really important and also shields you from debate. So if someone says, I have the best business for X, Y, and Z, it's a super debatable comment. But if they're sharing stories of customers that they've helped and different challenges that they've overcome through different you know, means that they've done that, whether it's certain processes, whether it is maybe a magic formula, but they're inserting someone else that they're edifying and not themselves, it's very difficult to, to blow holes through that argument. Interesting. Wow. I, you know, I hadn't thought about that. So it, it's, it's, it's kind of a means of protection. You know, it's, it's kind of guarding, you know, uh, fortifying and guarding the argument. 100%. And it's, it's very strategic in a way that you're doing it and you're doing it for inspiration, not, not manipulation. You know, whenever I work with a politician, I make them promise me that they use my concepts for inspiration, not to manipulate other people, because these story strategies can be so powerful. People can really manipulate others with them, right? So we need to make sure that our hearts are in the right place. We actually want to legitimately help people and we're not doing it to destroy people because, you know, these concepts fall Fallen into the wrong hands could be detrimental. You, you know, you hit on a really interesting point, and and it's something I've occasionally struggled with, where I'll use a method of persuasion that, <clears throat> from the outside, just appears casual. It appears like it's a normal conversation, and I'll see the impact that it has on a person. And there's been two times, in particular, where I it. Once it happened and once it had the impact, it, uh, it it kind of sent chills up my back. And I had to go back and say, okay, was I doing the right thing? Was, you know, and, and I concluded I was, but it was, it felt scary to have that kind of power. And how do you recommend people navigate that? I, they need to make sure that their intentions are pure. They need to make sure that they really understand what they're doing. I mean, once they get to the level of understanding that they say X, they're going to receive Y, right? So like as an example, there are stories that I share throughout my sales pipeline process through my marketing that based on the track record, I can almost guarantee there will be a return. Well, once I know that and I know that, hey, doing this is going to result in something that I want. Once you recognize that we need to be very intentional and strategic with it, but do it for use it for good, not for harm. I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of organizations out there that are not doing good things that use story strategy and they do it in a very poor way, right? So it really depends on on who these who who the concepts that we're talking about, the hands that it's falling into. Um, but it's just really recognizing the sheer magnitude that you have based on story strategy, which is 
very high. I mean, you could look at political leaders, you can look at uh, different business leaders that really grab a hold of what they're doing regarding story strategy and see what they've done. I mean, I always ask the question to people, do you really think Apple would be the company it is today if Steve Jobs didn't focus on storytelling? The answer is no way, right? Jobs focused on how to share different elements of that story and was able to build one of the most profitable businesses in human history. So he did it with his intentions being right in many, many ways. And business leaders need to ask themselves the same thing. Like you, if you understand the importance, then what are you doing to actually enhance that importance with what you're trying to accomplish? Yeah. And, you know, I was listening to an interview by a guy named Tony Fidel. I don't know if you know who he is. He's the, know. he's the father of the iPod. Uh, he was actually a contractor with Apple that was doing a, a concept study. And Steve Jobs brought him on board to actually build the iPod. And then he eventually did the iPhone and the iPad. And he said something really interesting. He said, when somebody asked him, you brought up Steve Jobs, how he was so, uh, how Steve did so well. He said, Steve was practicing that pitch, that story every day of the development. So if the development lasted 18 months, when you saw Steve Jobs on stage, he had 18 months of practice before he got up and, and did that. So I think the reason I bring that up, I would imagine there's some people that are listening, some people that you counsel that say, look, you know, people like Steve, they have the storytelling ability. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm no Steve Jobs. How would you respond to them? I would tell them to pat themselves on the back and they should be excited with that because the overwhelming majority of people that I coach that'll say the same thing. I'm not a great storyteller. I don't know how to communicate, uh, communicate effectively more than likely, those are the individuals that, if they really embrace the concepts, will be incredible when it comes to storytelling. There's numerous examples that we can point to as well. You know, Winston Churchill comes to mind. Um, when he was starting his political career, he was not the best orator in the world. And one could argue that toward the end of his political career, he's one of the reasons why the world didn't go dark, right? There's a, a major, major implications of him utilizing story strategy. I think that's a really good example. Um, I really love elements of that story. So hopefully, if, if you know, if you have individuals listening that are history buffs like myself, uh, basically, you know, I'll paint the scene for you, right? World War II, extremely dark time, Nazi Germany's tearing through Europe. And what's amazing to me is the United Kingdom did not see the French army falling. Okay, and when the when France fell into the Nazis' hands, now they knew that they were going to have to confront them head on. What's amazing about this whole thing is what did Winston Churchill do? He had a story strategy session. So while the Nazis were bombing his island relentlessly. Okay, so imagine London, imagine walking outside and you would see airplanes in, in the sky, not knowing if the airplane parts are going to be falling on your house or if your house is going to get bombed. With all this chaos, he had a story strategy session. And his story strategy session was, how do I get the United States involved? So that became part of his obsession where he was literally doing a deep dive when it came to messaging strategy back to the United States on here's why you need to get involved. Here's why it's so important. And a lot of people would view Winston Churchill as a masterful orator, right? But it's interesting if you watch him when he was first starting out or you would read stories about him, he was not an effective communicator in parliament. So that's just one of many examples. But to answer your question, people should literally pat themselves on the back and say they're in great company, that if they really do have an open mind and they embrace elements to really craft and hone in on their message, they will, they can be great for sure. So what's, what's the process look like? You know, so I decide that I want to start implementing stories in my business. How do I get started? Yeah, great question. First, you need to reframe your concept of what a story is. So often, 
you know, I'll go into a business and I'll ask individuals, you know, what is your view of a story? Tell me the first thing you think of when you think story or what's your current picture of storytelling? And it's, it's vast, right? Everyone comes to the table with a different perspective. And what's amazing is even in business, when most people recognize, well, everyone recognizes that storytelling is important, but most people will tell you, here's why it's important, because I understand it, it inspires and it persuades. And no one would say, hey, I want to be a worse storyteller. Everyone wants to be a better storyteller. But a lot of times, because there's a lot of confusion on what it looks like in business, we view storytelling as a Broadway play or a movie production, right? Where you need to perform for the audience. You need to razzle and dazzle your audience. That is not the kind of stories that we're talking about here. We're talking about stories that have a point. They, there's, there is a clear path to action. It takes your listener from point A to point B. And I, I, I always recommend to people, do not make this complex. Figure out a way to simplify this. So to answer your question, how you would simplify it is what you do is the very first thing is it starts with an emotion. Okay. So emotion is foundation when it comes to storytelling, there's different emotions that come up in business. So now there's many, many different emotions, uh, a lot of emotions. Uh, if you talk to someone like Brene Brown, who wrote a book called Atlas of the Heart, you know, she'll mention over 80 emotions, right? So there's a lot of emotions that a human being can understand and feel, there's really only a few that come up frequently in business. So what are these? Fear, anger, excitement, surprise. Those are your four that come up almost on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's unpack those, right? Obviously, fear. Customers might be really concerned about something. There could be anger. You know, maybe someone is throwing someone in the same basket as their competitor, so every time this entity is trying to get them to do something, it's bringing up certain stories when they were working with that entity's competitor, and it brings anger up. What about surprise, different market conditions, different changes, and then excitement? Everyone wants to be excited about what they're doing. Everyone wants to deliver more value to their customers. A lot of people want to make more money. So there's elements of excitement. So those are your four emotions. So that's the building block upon which stories stand. Okay. So the first thing is you identify the emotion. So let's take fear, for instance. Let's talk about fear regarding the economy. So that would be the topic that we're going to start with. Then the second thing is, is use great hooks when it comes to stories. So a hook when it comes to a story is the change. Okay. So the way change works is ordinary world, new reality. That's spurred on by the character that's being edified in the story. Okay. So some may say hero. So who's the hero? Well, the hero shouldn't be you. So the person edifying in your story, it should not be you. It should be someone else or something else. So someone else being a mentor or a customer or a team member or something else. It could be a concept. It could be a process. It could be a book, but it should not be you that you're edifying. Then once you do that, you simply piece those things together with the intention of you having the person or people that you're talking with seeing themselves in that story. So to answer your question, Craig, people should not view this as a complex operation. They should simplify it, how they simplify it, just to give you a rundown again. You focus on the emotion to start because emotion is foundation. Then you understand that there needs to be a hook, which is the change. It's ordinary world, new reality with someone else inserted as the person that you're going to edify. If people start doing that and they start building that habit and they start sharing stories with that intention, they will start to see results that they had not seen before. Interesting. <clears throat> so I want to try something. Let's see if we could build a quick story. You brought up the emotion being fear. Um, I think a lot of the audience is looking at the economy they're a little bit afraid whether to invest or you know hire you know what to do I, people are afraid and um they um what would be the story that you would construct for let's say a five million dollar business that's looking at this economy and trying to figure out what to go what to do Perfect. All right. Great example. All right. So again, just to give a rundown. So the, the emotionist foundation, 
the emotion is fear in this case. So that's the emotion. That's the building block, building block upon which this story or stories would stand. Then you need to say, okay, ordinary world, new reality. A lot of it, it's going to be based on different past experiences. So I would come to this company, I would say, let's talk about what happened in 2007, 2008. Was that a scary time for your business as well? A lot of businesses would probably say yes, right? So the Great Recession, all kinds of mayhem happening, depending on you know what they did business-wise. Uh, it could have been really challenging, or maybe there was different opportunities, right? So let's talk about those challenges. Let's talk about those opportunities. And then what we do is, did they help customers through the Great Recession? Well, if the answer is yes, and they can pinpoint those customers, now you're starting to see reoccurring themes that even if the economy gets worse, even if we are in another recession very soon, how did you navigate the last one? And you start really understanding these different themes, and it really helps us process that we can be creative. So like as an example, I'll give you an example in, in my own life, the Great Recession was extremely challenging for me, but it, there was also more growth than I had ever experienced in my entire life, right? I had to shift things. I had to be creative. I learned so much about business and how to scale different things. And it was incredible, right? So those are the stories I'm telling myself now as we might be facing a more gloomy economy. Well, it's, no, and that's so true. And that. And I would imagine one of the things that biz business owners, business leaders need to keep in mind, there as, there's a fair part of the workforce that has never experienced a down economy. You know, their entire career has been in an expanding economy. And so all of this must feel different, must feel scary. And I see, you know, going back to the Winston Churchill example of giving people hope in a time of great fear. So let me let me ask you this. You 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 know previously uh you worked with politicians and you know I I I think it's no secret that we're at a time of hyperpolarization. You support this guy, this group of people hate you. You support this other guy, this other group of people hate you. And it, it's where I've seen the dialogue move. It used to be, we disagree. Now the dialogue is, they believe this, therefore they're evil. And there's always been hints of that, but it's really, really amplified there. Um, how would you advise people? And, and this is just kind of, this is more in the leadership uh, standpoint. That's now I would imagine there are business owners that are facing this with employees. How do you recommend that people navigate this in a way that pulls people together as opposed to pushing people apart? Great question. So first, let me start out by saying I am extremely optimistic for the future, okay? Which often when I say that to people, they're kind of surprised by that. So have I seen darkness, if you will, have I seen politicians that are very manipulative and they do horrific things and they get involved in things that they shouldn't? Absolutely. And I've seen the darker side of humanity from being in the political world. You know, I always I always joke that I hate politicians more than most people because I've seen more garbage behind the scenes. OK, so I have seen a lot of crap, so to speak, by being involved with many different campaigns and different elected officials. Absolutely. And there are people that I would never want to work for. And there are people that I work for that have been incredible, right? So I've seen the darker side of politics, but I am unbelievably optimistic for the future for a few reasons. So what you mentioned regarding th this split on, you know, us versus them, a lot of that is based on, well, there's a lot of factors, but one of which is the way we consume news has radically changed. Okay. So I think this is something simple, but it's something that's really important for people to recognize. Okay. Years ago, there was, there was investigative journalism on every level. So even years ago, when it came to a local municipality, there were, there were reporters that would go and they would spend time actually researching and focusing on facts and different puzzle pieces to the equation. A lot of that is gone, okay, due to restrictions on, on news entities being able to pay for people to be in the field. 
a lot of it has changed now to clickbait when it comes to news because it is a business for them, right? They get paid off of largely speaking advertisements. So the more eyeballs on a screen or the more listeners that tune in, the more you can go and you get different advertisers and you're going to make more money. So you want that. So you're doing everything you possibly can to get eyeballs on a certain screen. So the what they're going to be doing is they're going to be presenting different cases in egregious ways for shock value, for getting people back to those emotions really revved up when it comes to fear and anger, because fear and anger really move the needle when it comes to getting eyeballs on websites. So I really want to challenge everyone listening to pause and recognize regardless of what news agency you tend to get your news from, you need to look at what is being said and ask yourself, is this to incite fear or anger in me? And then let's start to dive down and let's talk about it from a logical perspective. So logically speaking, especially when we're talking about Washington, D.C., both parties agree on way more than they disagree on, way more. The overwhelming majority of different policy initiatives is agreed on behind the scenes. It is a small percentage that is disagreed on, and the small percentage ties into different organizations that really help with voting and bringing people out to the ballot box. So those are the kind of topics that end up making the news, very emotionally charged topics. In addition, and this is kind of where the dark side of politics comes in, I view politics today as professional wrestling. So in a professional wrestling setting, you know, if you're not if you're not interested in professional wrestling, I'm sure people will understand this analogy where, you know, you might see someone hitting someone with a chair in a ring and then later that night they're having dinner together and they're just buddy buddy. The same is true in politics where you'll see someone bash someone at a press conference and then the following day they're having lunch with that person. They know their family. They have a working relationship with them, but they understand they need to play that game in order to get votes. Is that right? No. And there's a lot of a lot of elements of politics that is crazy and heinous in other ways. However, just because someone's bashing someone in the news doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have a working relationship with them behind the scenes. So there's a lot of factors that are happening. Also, we get news primarily from the palm of our hand due to smartphones. We never had that before. So something that might be a concern would, would not be in your mind years ago based on reading a physical newspaper and then that newspaper's in the trash. Now it's a 48-hour just bombardment, if you will, of certain topics. So we think things are much worse than they actually are. So with all that said, I am optimistic because I see it more of a generational aspect versus the just what topics happening from day to day. Thank you. And that's, you know, I think that's important to understand that uh, our political leaders agree on a lot more than they disagree. I suspect that's also true in our personal relationships. And, you know, there are people I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in the lives of others where they've had friendships just dissolve over the last few years because of everything going on. How would you advise them? You know, and, and the reason at the heart of this is I believe we need to come back together as a country. I think we need to fall in love with our fellow man again, even those that we disagree with. And how would you encourage, so that's a political level that you answered. How about a personal level, the people that we encounter in lives, in our lives that you know, may have radically different views than us? How should we engage them? Yeah, so I think there's a, a big difference between tribalism and creativity. <laughs> a vast difference. So let me explain. A lot of what we've done as a society has geared towards tribalism. So basically it is, us versus them, they're wrong, we're right. And it has sparked all kinds of highly emotionally charged discussions. And there's an element of pain with that, okay? Because we have programmed our minds that what they do is wrong, what we do is right. I want people to really embrace the creative aspect. So in business, we often talk about innovation, right? Innovating for our customers, which is great. We do need to be innovative. It's very rare we talk about internal creativity, but internal creativity is equally 
important. We need to be creative to spur on new ideas. So if you view it as I'm going to be getting better by listening to other perspectives and you you have that perspective shift, you're going to be a lot more willing to hear different insights to refine you and make you better. You know, one of the things I love doing, I love bringing everyone to the table. I love listening to different perspectives because I learn, I grow as a person. I can't tell you how many people have come to me and I start the meeting in my mind thinking I, I'm, I disagree with what they have to say. But as they start going through research, as they start presenting their own perspective, it gives me something else to think about. And my creative juices in my mind start turning and it makes me a better person. And I think we need to get back to that. I think if we view it more as almost like a game, if you will, let's play a game called how can we get more creative? Well, in order to play that game, you need other characters and you need those characters to be sharing with you different perspectives that might be different from yours based on your worldview, based on your experience. So I think if we really go into it with a creative mindset versus the mindset of tribalism, we will start to see positive change. And that's that is such great advice. Thank you for sharing that. We um, unfortunately we we've run out of time, Matt. I you know we we've talked before, and the one thing that's clear is I I could listen to you for hours. You you have so many incredible insights. Uh, so that's one thing that's clear. And the uh, the other thing I know about you is you have a passion for uh, history and and Winston Churchill. And you know I I just wonder how many people would benefit from going back and studying Churchill based, you know, based on what you, you said, he, you know, he, he didn't only pull a nation together, he pulled the world together. And um, the other thing that's hit me as we've been talking, you know, I, I consider myself somewhat of a storyteller. I, I write uh, persuasive narratives, love writing about us pages for websites that are completely non-traditional. And, and as I'm listening to you, it's abundantly clear. I could learn so much from you. And I believe others could. How should people contact you? Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the the kind words for sure. Uh, they can go to my website, Stories of Attraction. So if you go to storiesofattraction.com, you can check out my, my social media uh, presence. You can see different services that I provide. Um, also, I also run a podcast uh, called uh, Stories of Attraction. So if you go to Stories of Attraction on Apple, Google, Spotify, all the major podcasting channels, you will find me there. Well, excellent. Um, well, thank you. Uh, for coming today. Thanks for sharing your insights and um, really enjoyed them. I hope people reach out to you uh, because I think you can change them personally, but I also think you can change their business. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate your time today.